This is a time of revival. As the Lord's church grows and our ministry team expands and we anticipate additional leaders who will shepherd and oversee the flock serving as elders, what a great time this is to be involved with God's people here, isn't it? And this summer we've appreciated James Gatewood, one of our own, serving as our college intern. This evening at five, he'll be bringing the message of God to us and we encourage everyone to be present for that. And these baptisms, Tyler here and Will out in California, what an exciting time this is to anticipate, to look forward to, to dream about and pray about what God has in store for all of us. And yet it's a time for serious contemplation, for reflection, for prayer, for submission to God. Because what is before us as we look among ourselves for those men who meet these qualities and have these traits, who will then serve in such a pivotal and significant capacity, we must be on our knees before God, fervent and humble and obedient to His will and knowledgeable of His Word. I thought, who among us might illustrate what it means to care for the sheep? Well, here is Ethan Luna, as pictured on Facebook, who brought his stuffed lamb to his mother Sarah and said, I need to talk to little Bo Peep because I found her sheep. I thought, that's it. Here is a lamb himself, and he's already thinking about someone else that needs care, needs to be returned, needs to be safe and secure. I must tell you how thankful I am for the six men who already serve in the role that we're discussing today. I love each of these men. And you know that every Lord's Day, one of them begins our time of worship by welcoming us, telling us what's going on, and looking forward to what lies ahead. I'm grateful for them and for their wives. And I know you join me in that thankfulness and in that spirit of prayer for them. As we begin today, I want to note with you that there are several terms used for the leadership role supervising, overseeing the congregation. In Acts 14, 23, they were to appoint elders in every church. And then we see, as these men are addressed, they're also called overseers and pastors or shepherds. The first word, elders, indicates that they have some age under their belt, some experience and some wisdom. And because of that, they can help make decisions in areas of judgment, helping us follow the scripture, resolve conflicts. Even the Old Testament elders did that when people who had a a question could come and the older men would assist them in that. And then overseers, the King James Bible had the word bishops, suggest watching over, having charge of, caring for, administering. And then pastors, shepherding, guiding, counseling, correcting, and protecting. I want to note that I am not one of the elders, overseers, pastors of this church. From time to time, a person will write a note or send a message or may address me by the term of pastor. But the fact is, I have the delightful privilege of focusing on proclaiming the word and evangelizing and teaching. These men, on the other hand, are responsible for the entire work and effort of the church here. And that makes me so grateful for them because that allows me to do what I believe God would have me do with the gifts he's given me. The term pastor and preacher are not synonymous. For example, a young single man could be an evangelist, a proclaimer of the word, but he could not be an elder, overseer, or pastor because these men must be married and have believing children. Even the Apostle Paul, as effective as he was, to our knowledge, did not have a wife and children. He was a great evangelist, but he would not have met the qualities we're going to consider today. We're going to look at several passages, and I'll put them here for you to see, but also encourage you to follow along in your Bible. Typically, I don't put all the words of Scripture because I like to encourage each person to have your own text. But because we're going to look at several of these, I thought I would move from that and do something a bit differently today. 
I wanted to note in the previous slide that elders, that's a plural word. In every church, that is singular. God's design in the New Testament is that each independent, autonomous congregation of followers of Jesus, each congregation would have a plurality, a set of men who would oversee, shepherd, and help decide according to God's will as that church serves according to the scripture. It's very important because if one person were to be in charge of a church, that individual's weaknesses, perhaps lack of balance, including myself or anyone else, would lead the church astray. And we've seen that happen in the religious world all around us. The first passage we're going to note is Acts chapter 20. This is the function we're going to see as Paul summons the elders from Ephesus to meet him in Miletus. And where verse 17 calls them elders, he then refers to them as overseers and also charges them to pastor or shepherd the church of God. Its value is that he purchased it with his own blood. And for that reason, it deserves the best of men with the diligent, dedicated, devout spirit to care for what does not belong to them or to any of us, but to God himself. I want you to notice here, be on guard for whom? First, yourselves then also the flock. These godly men follow in his steps, seek his direction, and make sure that in their own lives and their personal spiritual walk with God, they help each other to serve and to follow and to do what God would have them do. Well, then I want you to see the need as that passage goes on we could talk about Paul's words, how he served them, working with his own hands. He didn't covet anyone's silver or gold or possession. He did this to set an example. And he talks about it, not to brag on himself, but to say, I've tried to show you it's more blessed to give than to receive, as Jesus said. And I've tried after my departure to make sure that you'll be aware that fierce wolves will come in among you. They won't spare the flock. Look at verse 30. From among your own selves will arise men speaking twisted things and draw away the disciples after them. Therefore, look at verse 31. For three years, day and night, I never ceased admonishing everyone with tears. Why? Because of what's at stake. This is the body of Christ, the bride of Christ. This is the kingdom of God as it's expressed on earth. And we want all to be around the throne one day, celebrating and singing and thanking Him forever. That's what's at stake. And so these who recognize the need and see the function must be aware of the dangers from the outside and also that can come from within. I think of the fuel in verse 32 God and the word of his grace. This will build you up. This will give you the inheritance among all those who are sanctified. And for that reason, the church's leaders are men of the word, immersed in it, committed to it, familiar with it. Next, I'd like you to turn to 1 Timothy chapter 3. And as we go through, I'll note each scripture we're considering, but highlight the one that's next. 1 Timothy chapter 3 begins describing the idea that a man would aspire, would strive toward, would be willing to desire this role or function of an overseer, and that this is a noble task. You know, to serve as an elder of God's people is not something that we might consider mandatory. It's not just a forced obligation. It's something that an individual, out of his own love for the Lord and for the mission we have, would step out and would offer and volunteer and give of his life for this great cause. Why would a person do that? Well, I've suggested gratitude for the grace of God, a desire to imitate Christ, as we heard earlier about a plane going down and people perishing in the Potomac, I was reminded either of that flight or another one, I'm not sure, where an individual in that freezing water named Arlen D. Williams 
received the life ring and he could have put it over himself and gone to safety but instead Arlen Williams passed it to the next person and then it came to him again and he handed it off and handed it off and handed it off at some point Arlen Williams had to know that he himself was going to die that the hypothermia would overtake him and he would not make it out and that's exactly what happened and Time Magazine named him the man in the water and the whole nation heard about it more recently we've heard of our brother in Christ Dr. Kent Brantley going with others to help those stricken with Ebola and contracting it himself that sense of sacrifice that willingness to give to do what perhaps others would not ordinarily do that's the kind of motivation that a person when he wants to be like Christ develops the qualities and traits and then seeing the church's need feels a responsibility to react we could list these and we're going to do so and could take quite a bit of time going through each one but overall they're self-explanatory aren't they above reproach that suggests one who is blameless particularly regarding the things that follow that this person could not be charged with uh, drunkenness or the lack of self-control or a lack of hospitality or ability to teach that there's no charge that could be laid against this man he's the husband of one wife faithful married to her and true to her he thinks clearly and soberly in a way that's mature. He's not given to uh, impulses and rash behavior. He's self-controlled. He's one that other people respect. His home and his heart are open in hospitality. And he knows the Word of God and can present it to other people. As you see these traits, you recognize that for which we all aim to reach. And in every person, no matter who we are, to be like Christ is to exemplify these attributes. And yet we also know not one person has them perfectly except for Christ. And so when we talk about these things, the bar is very high. But it's not to discourage those who are genuinely faithful and who meet these criteria was from saying, well, I'm not perfect. I don't think I could do that but instead to see that if others recognize this in you, then you are one that we know would serve effectively in this way. And for that reason, these nomination forms that are here in the foyer that you may take in just a bit, you'll have these scriptures listed and then you can consider those that might meet these qualities in that significant way. Notice the husband of one wife. Obviously, these are males. And so women would not qualify to serve in this role. And it is what the man does in his commitment to his marriage, and we'll see in a moment to raising his children, that helps to prepare him and helps to demonstrate what God looks for in that kind of a leader. Not a drunkard, not addicted to wine, the scripture says, not violent, but gentle. This is a man with his temper in hand, that's not argumentative, that's not interested in money, that's able to resolve matters, reconcile, talk things out, be a peacemaker. And then here, I wanted to mention back a moment, the knots. You know, we have, it must be these things, and then here are some knots. Keep those in mind. And then what follows next is reasons given for some of the qualities. Now, in various cases, we can infer that this trait is given because it suggests this or this but in this case we're told he manages his own household well with all dignity keeping his children submissive why for or because if someone doesn't know how to manage his own household how will he care for God's church then verse 6 he's not a recent convert why because if he were he might become puffed up and conceited and the implication is that's what happened to the devil became full of himself and arrogant and proud. And look at verse 7. Those outside the church must also have a high regard for this man. Why? So that 
He will not fall into disgrace. And that would again give the devil an opportunity to ensnare him. If you go down to verse 11 for a moment, it's in the middle of a description of deacons, which is not our primary concern. The Greek text in verse 11 literally says, likewise the women. It could be a reference to the wives of the deacons or the overseers or both. In any case, it shows the traits that Christian women aspire to have, likewise, and that these qualities assist and encourage and support husbands who serve in the role of overseers or elders or pastors. Next look at Titus 1, verses 5 through 11. It's a similar parallel text to what we saw to Timothy, and yet we're going to notice an additional emphasis which fits with the other regarding the danger of false teaching and the importance of being able to stand up and speak up and rebuke and correct that which is in error. I cannot stress this emphasis enough because in my experience in years of working with God's people, I have seen this ability, this assertiveness, this backbone when elders say, this is right. We will follow it. We will not move from it. We will stay in God's book. And we will not let something creep in or sneak in or slide in that's going to take us away from the New Testament pattern and the plan that God has given. Well, as you begin there in Titus, we note above reproach, husband of one wife, that word debauchery, your Bible may have dissipation. It has to do with being wasteful and overindulgent. In other words, the children are under control and not given to excess or insubordination. That is rebelling against the father's authority because the leadership he'll have in the church is one of uh, a role of delegated authority. God's steward in verse 7, it's the first time we've seen that word, suggests a manager, someone who is accountable, someone who handles that which is not his own and will give an answer for what he's done with God's work and God's people. Notice again, above reproach, not arrogant. Your Bible may say not self-willed. He's not one that has to have his own way, that's insistent, that stands independent of all the others who forces his agenda, for example, on the group or on the church. Not quick-tempered, we noted that, and the others. Not drunkard, not violent, not greedy for gain. He's not drawn to money. Money is his servant and not his master. He sees it as a tool to be used to glorify God. Hospitable, I like this phrase, a lover of good, as God defines it. Not what the world says is good, but what God presents for us. Self-control, upright, that is he stands tall in spirit, holy, that is consecrated, dedicated, devoted to God, and disciplined. What a tremendous principle that is for all of us to deny those things that might weaken our commitment to Christ and not to compromise or become complacent as we heard earlier this morning. This, in verse 9, the grasp of this God's kind of leader is the trustworthy word as taught. It's this right here. And there are two reasons that this man must know this book. First, so that he may be able to give instruction in sound or healthy doctrine, and that he may rebuke those who contradict it. When leaders stand on the rock and refuse to budge, the preaching will be what it needs to be. The worship will be as God has designed it. The offer of salvation, the response to it, will be with that that comes out of this. It all grows out of this grasp of the trustworthy word. And if something sounds off, if something is loose, if something is not what it ought to be, these are the men that rebuke those who contradict God's truth. 
And then verse 10. For, here's a reason given. Insubordinate, empty talkers, deceivers, especially in that time, those of the circumcision party trying to subvert, trying to distort and corrupt the message of God. They have to be silenced. They're upsetting whole families. And whenever that happens in the church, something false, something wrong that's taught, that is upsetting people, then the leaders of the church have that grasp that enables them and empowers them, and they can work as a team to support uh, the message of the Bible. Now let's look at 1 Peter chapter 5, if you would turn there. We might call this the charge because it's not so much the qualities here, though we will touch on that, but it has to do with I exhort. Notice that Simon Peter is a fellow elder. He was, unlike Paul, uh, Peter was a married man and met the qualities that are given in Scripture. He's also a witness of the sufferings of Christ and he anticipates the glory to be revealed in which he will partake. Notice again the word elders, then the word shepherd, which tells us that these men are the pastors of the church and exercising oversight, superintending, watching over God's people. Here's something of the how and the why. Not under compulsion. One should not be coerced. And as you talk to different individual brothers and ask them if they would consider this, it's not for you and me to somehow compel them or push them when that motivation is not deep within. It's willing as God would have it. God wants all of us to serve out of our love, our gratitude, and our faith and not because of some external burden that has been placed in our lap. Not for shameful gain, we've seen that already, not for some financial advantage or prominence or fame or popularity, but eagerly, here is one who cannot wait, who looks forward to and anticipates the things that God has called such a leader to do. Not domineering over those in your charge, not tyrannical, not dictatorial, but being examples to the flock. That is, showing and not just telling how we are to follow the Lord. And then verse 4, here's the reward. These men are shepherds, but they are not the chief shepherd. It's a subordinate role to him, and when he appears as he will, there is an unfading crown of glory for those that have accepted this tremendous task. And then finally, who's next? Look among yourselves. Look at yourself. And as you pray, and as you seek God's help, and as you look for those that might be part of what God is doing here, this revival, this future, this unlimited potential in Keller, Texas. Do so with humility and with faith and deep and personal, fervent prayer and consideration. And if, as we've talked about these qualities, you've said, I don't have those. Men, make that your list and strive and grow and reach and become that man that these passages describe. We mentioned a few moments ago the man in the water who passed the life ring. We talked about Dr. Kent Brantley. Those stories move us because they reflect what Jesus did when he denied his own life all the potential, all the decisions that he could have made to be free, and yet he went to the cross. When we come to Jesus Christ, we come first as a sheep, wanting to be brought into the fold. And so we say, yes, I believe he is the Christ, the Son of the living God. We repent of our sins. We're buried with him in baptism and raised again as a sheep. And then as we follow God helps us to become those who lead and influence others. If you would come today, why not now as we stand and sing?